Turn to two or three people and tell them, I've got joy in the Holy Ghost today. I've got joy in the Holy Ghost today. Amen, amen. Tell them the Holy Ghost has put a smile on my face. Amen. Tell them the Holy Ghost has put a spring in my step. And tell them the Holy Ghost has put joy in my heart. And tell them the Holy Ghost gives me peace today. Peace was passed over. How many is thankful for the power of the Holy Ghost? How many is glad for that day the Lord's filled you full of the Holy Ghost? Amen. I think you ought to give him praise and thank him for the power that's in the Holy Ghost. Amen, 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 amen. If you'd stand for the reading of the word of the Lord today, we want to get right into the word of the Lord this morning. I believe that God has given us direction as what he'd have for us to bring to you today. I want to say to Elder Brian, marvelous job this morning in teaching to us the word of the Lord. <clears throat> marvelous job. Marvelous job today. How many is thankful for the word of God? Are you thankful? How many is thankful for the truths of the word of God? So very, very thankful. So very, very thankful for the word of God. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. I want you to turn with me today to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Beginning with verse 1 and reading through verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Beginning with verse 1 and reading through verse 12. I want to say to all of our guests today, we're so thankful for you being in the house of the Lord. Would you give them a warm welcome with a hand clap? Let them know you're glad they're here today. God bless you. You ready for the word of the Lord today? 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning with verse 1 and reading through verse 12. The word of the Lord says this, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto him. Rather, thou shalt anoint me, him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And then Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all of thy children? Is this all of your children? Are these all of your boys? And Jesse said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. Everyone shout, He keepeth the sheep. He keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Look at verse 11 again, and it says, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all of thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep he keepeth the sheep and no doubt while David was keeping the sheep he communed with God and worshiped God and talked to God 
and heard from God and dwelt with God. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. By the help of the Lord today, for the next few moments, I want to preach on this simple thought, three words, the secret place. Would you say the secret place? Would you say it again, the secret place? Would you lay your Bibles down and would you raise your hands and let's pray that the anointing of God would rest upon our ears to receive the word of God today and the anointing of the Lord would rest upon our minds to receive this hour for his word is already anointed. Lord Jesus, we come before you now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you for what I feel in this house. And Lord, I thank you for the anointing of Almighty God that's here this very moment. And God, I thank you for the worship that's gone up before your name. And I thank you for the glory and power and the presence of God that's moving among your people. And Lord, I pray that you'd anoint our minds to receive your word. And God, may we forever be changed by that word. May our life be changed today. May we never be the same. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, anoint my mind. Help my mind to be alert. And God, loose my tongue that I may speak to your people under the anointing and unction of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone shout amen. Would you put your hands together for about 15 seconds and give the Lord praise and glory and honor. love you today. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. The secret place. Everyone shout the secret place. I would have liked to have had the privilege of knowing David. For in his latter years and even in his early years, he showed a military genius which may never be rivaled in human history. He led a weak, obscure nation to become a world power to be reckoned with. And he had unusual athletic skills and He had unusual administrative skills and a wonderful facility to be able to inspire and lead others. God writes the story of this man. In reading the word of God and reading the story of Abraham, we find that Abraham's story is given in 14 chapters. In reading the life story of Joseph and Joseph's life chronicle is described in 14 chapters chapters and Jacob's story is told in 11 chapters and Elijah's story feels only nine Bible chapters however in studying the word of God and reading through the word of God you find that David's life story feels 66 Bible chapters with 59 references about him in the New Testament, plus what he wrote about himself in the Psalms. It is safe to say today that David is considered by many to be the greatest character in the Old Testament after Moses. Each character that we study about in the Word of God has some particular characteristics and some particular value that makes them worth studying. Joshua was blessed for an example in that he had the opportunity of leading the people into the land which God had promised Abraham. We understand and know that David was blessed and that he had the privilege of setting up the kingdom in that land. God brings us back repeatedly to situations in which we can see the continuity of his whole program. The promise of Abraham is not something we study and forget. It reoccurs in the lives of most of these Old Testament figures. And the same thing is true when you get into the New Testament. We find there that uh, we are not starting with a whole new series of persons, but each one has some particular part in that unfolding plan of God by which he accomplishes and his eternal purpose. And David was the one who set up the dynasty. And Saul, of course, had been the first king of Israel, but Saul necessarily did not set up the eternal dynasty. It is not the house of Saul, but the Bible calls it the house of David. 
which is forever. The house of David does not like a man that sit on the throne of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is of the house and lineage of David. And so you see in a particular way, David is the one who in God's wisdom and in God's will brought about here on earth. And in its initial stages, at least the kingdom of God, which God had foretold when he made his promises to Abraham. David's story starts in the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, which we read, read in your hearing today. And it runs through the rest of the first book of Samuel. David was born. We understand and know that we gather in reading the word of the Lord that David had a godly mother. There are, I think, two references to that in the book of Psalms, in the 86th chapter and the 116th chapter, where Psalm 86 and 16, he prays to God, and David says, turn me and take pity on me. Give thy strength to thy servant and save the son of thy handmaid. Likewise, in Psalm 116 and verse 16, he refers to himself as the son of thy handmaid. David referred to his mother as the handmaid of the Lord. And at least twice in this psalm, the inference from that statement is substantiated by the life of David in which we find the characteristics of a man who has been brought up by his mother to know the Lord and to trust him. I've come to tell you today that the choices we make determine the shape and the color of our lives. It doesn't work that way very often. Many of our lives' most crucial decisions occur in lonely open fields where you can't even find rabbit tracks. It's just you and the sheep. Others are made in congested thoroughfares where it is so crowded your feet don't even touch the pavement as you move with the throng at the pedestrian crossing. Some decisions are far enough down the road that you have plenty of time to think about them before the road forks and other decisions open suddenly at your feet demanding instant action. And at such moments as these when crisis flashes from a clear sky, what you know isn't as important as who you know. And I'm so very thankful that when I come against the things of a life, and I'm so very thankful that when I've got to make decisions in my life, and I'm so very thankful when the trials and tests of my life come against me. It's not really what I know, but it's who I know. And I, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And is there something different about who you know when you're going through life's trials and tests? There's something different about who you know when you're facing difficulties in your life. There's something about who you know when you're standing in an emergency room and you get a bad doctor's report. It's about who you know when you stand in a trial and test in your life and, and the devil looking right square down at you and you say, I understand who you are and I understand what you are and I know you've come to destroy me. You've come to kill and steal and destroy but God has given me life and life more abundantly. I'm glad I know that he is the mighty God. I'm glad I know that God is the everlasting father. I'm glad I know that he is the prince of peace. I'm glad I know that greater is he that is is in me than he that is in the world. If you're thankful you know who he is, would you put your hands together and give God praise and thank him for who he is. I understand and know that he's with me every step of the way. I understand and know that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I understand and know that if God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, if you're thankful, clap your hands and give God praise. Come on, I, I, I. I've come to tell somebody today you're not by yourself. I've come to tell somebody today that God is fighting the battle with you. I've come to tell somebody today that you're walking with the Lord and everything's going to be all right. If you know who he is, everything is going to be all right. Hey, I just don't know him. Rather, I just don't know about him but I know him. You see, it's one thing when you read the Psalms and you know the Psalms. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. It's one thing you can quote Psalm 23, but it's a different thing when you begin to quote Psalm 23 and you know who the shepherd is. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. It's one thing you can declare by his stripes we are healed. And you can quote that scripture. But it's another thing when you understand and know that he's my healer and he's my redeemer. There's something that gets a hold of you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. There's something powerful that rests upon you when you know who he is. 
Oh, why do I worship the way I do? Why do I clap my hands the way that I do? Why do I run the aisles the way that I do when I'm going through hell on earth, when my world is turned upside down, when everything's wrong in my life because I can still worship him and know that everything is going to be all right because I know who he is, because I've been in the secret place of my life and know that he is going to move on my behalf. I know who he is. The important question to ask is not so much am I walking in the right direction, but rather am I walking with the director? Woo! Hey! If you've been walking daily with the living God, drawing your life from him, the crisis step is simply the next step. Woo! My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Here I am, Lord. Instant decision time. You know that I want your best in this, so lead on. And I'm going to be right behind you. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that if I make, that if I make my bed in hell, he is there. If I soar on the wings of the morning, he is there. Ha ha. If I look to the left, he is there. If I look to the right, he is there. If I look in front of me down the road, he is there. If I look behind me, he is there. It doesn't matter where I find myself. It doesn't matter what may surround me. It doesn't matter what is going on in my life. If I find myself in a heap of mess, God is right there. If I find myself in a heap of trouble, God is right there. If I find myself all consumed by the things of this world, God is right there because I've been in a secret place and I know who God really is and I understand that if he did it for me yesterday, he's going to do it today. If he delivered me yesterday. He's going to deliver me today. For the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't matter whether I look at my past or the present or the future. He is still God, and I know who he is. Oh, if you're thankful, put your hands together and give God praise. Hey, hallelujah. On the other hand, you're walking in dependence on yourself and your own judgment. The crisis step can be terrifying. One wrong turn can alter a lifetime. Two men, Saul and David, approached the same intersection together and parted company. One man ascended the stairs unparalleled honor while the other fell broken and disgraced into the basement of obscurity. The two of them had the same privilege, the same opportunity, the same brilliant blessings of God and the same God. Yet only one of them found favor in the annuals of Israel. Today, the star of David flutters proudly over the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. Think of it. After 30 centuries, the name of David is esteemed all over the world while Saul, Israel's first king, is somewhere back in the dim shadows of history. Both Saul and David felt an anointing to some degree. But Samuel the prophet splashed through the curls and trickled over the beard, broad shoulders while David was still a young man. And no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, God's hand was upon David. David was appointed by God. And the Bible says that the prophet visited Jesse and asked to see his sons. And seven of them filed past one by one as Samuel fingered his flowing gray beard. And, and I could see old Samuel piercing the Bethlehemite with a, with a very, very intense stare from under his great bushy eyebrows. And he begins to say and ask the question, are you sure this is all of them? Well, well all of them, I'm well, almost all of them. Jesse may say, I, I mean, that is to say, not exactly all of them. There, there's one more out in the pasture. A mere teenager, you understand, looking after a few sheep. He's by himself. But wouldn't you, that is, he couldn't, uh, wouldn't, shouldn't you, would you bring him in? So he sent the Bible, said, and had him brought in. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him, he is the one. So we find that the hand of God rested on David. And we find to some degree that the hand of God rested upon 
Saul, and both men enjoyed great physical advantages, and both young kings were valiant generals and succeeded in beating and battering the enemies of, of Israel on battle after battle, and both were crowned uh, near the same age, and both were husbands, and both were fathers. Uh, what tremendous men they were, privileged and blessed of God in many ways. And so you, you say to yourself, what's the difference? Uh, why do we remember David as a great man and Saul as a defeated man? The name of David echoes throughout Scripture with splendor and power, through the prophets and through the gospels and through the epistles. Uh, but Saul, it's like someone padlocked the file. What happened? He started well. One after another, he fought down his enemies, the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Amalekites and the Syrians. Uh, he overcame them. Then at the height of his popularity and power, he tried to reckon without his God. Uh, drunk with the sight of power, he ignored God's voice and sought that of a witch of Endor. And Saul moved ahead of God for reasons that, that sounded good and made necessary sacrifices himself. And Saul did not obey the commands of the Lord. And Saul lost touch with his spiritual reality and Saul chose to glorify himself instead of his God. And Saul took matters into his own hands and set his will above God's will. And Saul never really, it's safe to say, had a relationship with God. Saul was never really intimate with God and Saul, no doubt, never really had a passion with God when it came to God and the things of God. However, you will find a young man by the name of David out in the hills of Judea who at an early age was tending his father's sheep. He was in the muck. He was in the midst of dung. He was stinking. He smelled like sheep. He was sleeping with the sheep. He was chapped from the hot sun. He didn't look like a ruler. He didn't look like a leader. He didn't look like a king. He didn't look like a man of God. He was just a shepherd. But this young shepherd boy out in the hills of Judea, you would find him in secret worshiping and magnifying God. You would find him giving alms of praise and sacrifice to God. You would find him in secret calling out to God and communing with God and building his relationship with God and having an encounter with Almighty God. You will find him in secret as he tended to the sheep, getting the heartbeat of God in the midst of the pasture and the rocks and the sheep in intense prayer, getting a hold of God, crying out to God, move me, crying out to God, make me, crying out to God, shape me and change me, do whatever you gotta do in me for God I dwell in the secret place and God I sense your presence and I sense your power and I need you to do something special in my life that's what made David different that's what made David special. That's what made David a peculiar young man. That's what made David chosen of God. That's why David was so mightily used of God. That's why David was so mightily anointed of God because of what he did in secret, because of what he did among the valleys, and because of what he did among the sheep, and because of what he did as a shepherd. I've come to tell you today that life's battles are won or lost in secret closets of prayer. Your spiritual battles are won or lost, as Elder Brian mentioned this morning, in wilderness places when nobody is watching you. Oh, it's easy to come to the house of God and sit on the front row or sit on the third row or sit on the sixth row and sit on the eighth row or the tenth row or even in the balcony and clap your hands and worship God and magnify God and do what it is you need to do to live for God and to worship God in the day and hour you're living in. But that's not going to get you through. What's going to get you through is when you're by yourself and pastor's not there. When you're by yourself and the musicians are not there. When you're by yourself and the praise team is not there. When you're by yourself and another saint of God is not there with you. You find yourself on the backside of the desert. You find yourself amongst the stink and the muck. And you say, God, I know who you are. And I worship you and I praise you and I magnify you. It's one thing doing it in the house of God. But it's another thing doing it when you're by yourself in the mess of life. It doesn't matter what I go through. It doesn't matter what I face. If I'm in the house of God or if I'm on the back side of the desert, he still gets my glory. He still gets my praise. And I'm still going to love him and worship him. The anointing of God on your life is dependent upon what you're doing while you're among the sheep. We become the persons or the people we are when we are alone when you're by yourself when no one's watching you 
when pastor doesn't call you. When someone doesn't show up to your house. We become what we are by what we do in the dark places of our life, in the quiet places of our life. David was prepared for the public encounter because in the privacy of being a shepherd, he got a hold of God. If we're ever, listen to me, if you're ever going to amount to anything, if we're ever going to be anointed of God, if we're ever going to be used of God, if we're ever going to have the revival that God has in store for us, if we're ever going to tap into the things of the supernatural, if we're ever going to have victory, if we're ever going to receive deliverance, we've got to find ourselves among the valleys and among the pasture and among the sheep in a secret place getting a hold of God and hearing the heartbeat of God. You can do what it is you want to do, but I'm going to find myself in the secret place. You can go where it is you want to go, but I'm going to find myself in the secret place. You can be like everybody else if you want to. You know what? I'm sick and tired of trying to be like everybody else. I'm not going to worship like everybody else. And I'm not going to have a church like everybody else. And I'm not going to sing. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to sing like everybody else. And I'm not going to dress like everybody else. And I'm not going to do what everybody else does. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be godly. I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to find myself in a secret place and understand and know that when I get a hold of God and when God gets a hold of me and I'm consumed by the power and the presence and the anointing of God, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. And God is going to anoint me. And God is going to use me. And God is going to call me out in the day and hour that I'm living in. I've encouraged some young people, it's time for you to be different. I dare you to be different. I've come to tell some men, it's time for you to be different. I dare you to be different. I've come to tell some women in the house today, I dare you to be different. I dare you to walk different. I dare you to talk different. I dare you to worship different. I dare you to profess differently. I dare you, I dare you, come on, I dare you, I dare you, I dare you, I dare you. It's got to be different in my life. I got to see God. I got to commune with God. I got to get a hold of God because I'm going to be fighting a lion and I'm going to be fighting a bear and I'm going to be fighting a Goliath. I've got to get a hold of God. It doesn't matter what my mama may do. It doesn't matter what my dad may do. It doesn't matter what my neighbor may do. I'm going to stand firm in the day and hour that I'm living in. And I'm going to dwell in the secret place and let God touch me. <laughs> you, can, you can live like everybody else is living. But I'm going to find myself in the secret place. For you listen to me, it's what I get a hold of in the secret place that brings about victory. Uh -huh. It's, it's what I get a hold of in the secret place that brings about my deliverance. It's what I get a hold of in the secret place that brings about an anointing upon my life. It's what I get, it's what I get a hold of in the secret place that, that causes me to have faith and trust and confidence in Almighty God. It's what I get a hold of in the secret place that brings about a touch of the supernatural in my life. David found it. David experienced it. David got a hold of it. David tapped into it as a shepherd in a secret place. Just him and God among the sheep. It wasn't by accident that I've heard along that David found himself as a young shepherd among his father's sheep. You may think it was, but it was not. It was ordained of God. It was ordered of God. It was directed of God. David could have got mad and said, why am I tending to the sheep? They stink. They don't appreciate what I'm doing. They wander off. Hello? They fall down and hurt themselves, and I could be the one to pick them up and carry them all the way home. God, what would you do to me? Why couldn't I be doing something different in my life? God, give me another ministry. God, let me find another place in my life. But no, David didn't say that. He'd take his harp and he'd walk out with the sheep. He began to praise God. 
and begin to magnify God. And he said, God, I know I'm not here by chance. God, you've got me here for a reason. And I want to be confident in that and be content in that and know that while I'm here, I don't know what you have in store for me, but I'm going to make the best of it and understand who you really are. Because if I understand who you are now, then you're going to reveal further my life of who you really are. I will see that manifested in my life. And so David kept his attitude and spirit in check. Because what he experienced in the secret place, because what transpired in the secret place, what occurred in the secret place not only brought deliverance then and there, but most importantly brought deliverance and victory in the future. While David was in his secret place, while David was tending to the sheep, getting a hold of God, going about his business, being intimate with God, the Bible tells us that there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And the Bible says that immediately David went after him and smote him. He did not hesitate and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against him, David caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And the Bible said he slew both the lion and the bear. He slew the enemy and the adversary that was trying to devour what belonged to him. He slew the predator that was after what was rightfully his. I've come to tell somebody today that when you are all by yourself and in your own little secret place worshiping and magnifying God and getting a hold of God and receiving a revelation of who God really is, there's going to be a lion and there's going to be a bear that's going to approach to try and discourage you. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. There's going to be an enemy that's going to try to devour what belongs to you. And there's going to be a predator that is after what is rightfully yours. But I have good news for somebody in this house today. The enemy didn't know what he was doing. And what the enemy meant for bad, God will turn it around for the good. And what the enemy was going to use for discouragement, I said God will turn it around and use it for encouragement. What the enemy was going to use for defeat, God will turn it around and use it for victory. And what the enemy was going to use to and still fear. God will turn it around and use to bring about assurance. And what the enemy was going to use for disappointment, God will turn it around. I said God will turn it around. God will turn it around and show who he really is. I've come to tell somebody today, you've been fighting a lion and you've been fighting a bear. Just trust in the God that you serve and the power that worketh on the inside of you. And you do what God has asked you to do. And God is going to turn that situation around. Weeping may and do it for a night. But honey, I've come to tell you, joy. I said joy. I said joy is coming in the morning. You may be fighting every devil in hell, and you may be fighting every lion and bear, but I've come to tell you, God has given you power in the secret place to overcome it today. God has given you power. And so hurrying along, moving along quickly, we find in the very next chapter, Chapter 17, that the Philistines gathered together their armies to do battle with the men of Israel. The Philistines were one of the thorns in the side of the Israelite kingdom in the days of Saul, in the early days of David. And now the Philistines were engaged in one of those conflicts when someone got a good idea. Why bother having a full-scale war where you can settle it with just a combat between just two men? Let us pick out one of our men and let the Israelites pick out one of theirs and then let the two of them slug it out. Whichever man is victor will say his side won. It will save us a lot of trouble. This is a smart way to have a war, particularly if you happen to have a giant on your side named Goliath. The estimations of his height was about nine feet eight inches tall. And Goliath's head was covered with a helmet of bronze and he wore a coat of mail that weighed about 125 pounds. His legs were protected below the knees with thin plates of bronze and slung across his shoulders was a javelin of bronze and in his hand was a spear that had a shaft like a weaver's beam and a spearhead that weighed about 15 pounds. In addition to this, he had a shield bearer who went before him. He couldn't carry his own shield. He didn't want to carry his own shield. He had somebody else do it for him. And you see Goliath, and he had very little chance to lose him when he suggested, I'll go out there and I'll fight any representative of Israel. And whoever wins the battle will be the victor. 
And the Bible tells us that the Israelites were dismayed and greatly afraid and they didn't quite know what to do. And they were in confusion and had lost their composure. Then we find this lad that was on the backside tending the sheep. Who has been in the field in the secret place talking with God. Here's the challenge issued and says with power and authority in my vernacular in the book of Anthony Moss. He says, I can take him. And I've come to remind somebody today that when you've been in the secret place, you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can take him. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. When you've been talking with God, you can face anything that you come up against. When you have an encounter with God and you've lived in the secret place, nothing seems impossible. You can walk out on the battlefield and proclaim, I can take him. I don't care how big he is, I can take him. I don't care how mighty he may think he is, I can take him. It doesn't matter who else is scared of him, I can take him. And I've come to tell the North Charleston Apostolic Church, it doesn't matter how big the devil is and it doesn't matter how big you think he is. You've got the power of the Holy Ghost and we are dwelling in the secret place and you can take him. All if you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. Hey! Some of you are afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of the devil. I said I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm going to say that again. I'm not afraid of the devil. Some of you are thinking, Pastor, you better be careful. You better not say that. You're going to face the devil. I, I, I'll say it again. I am not afraid of the devil. I am not afraid of the very gates of hell. Why? Because I've been in the secret place, and I know who he is. I know who God is. The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Everything's going to be all right. And when you know who he is in the secret place, you can say, I am not afraid of the devil. You know why I'm not afraid of the devil? Let me share with you why I'm not afraid of the devil. The Bible says that we'll... Woo, can I go there? Hold those for me for just a minute. I'm about to lose them. The Bible says in the Old Testament that we'll have the power to walk on an adder, which is a serpent. Okay, And the Bible says, Sister Maldi, that we'll have the power to walk on a lion. My God, I'm going there whether you want me to or not. The Old Testament says that we'll have the power to stay and walk on a dragon. Well, I've come to tell you this. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that very from the very beginning, Satan was revealed as a serpent. And in the book of 1 Peter, the Bible says that he was revealed as a roaring lion. And in the book of Revelation, he gets bigger and is revealed as a great dragon. What the Bible is saying, it doesn't matter whether he comes to you as a serpent. You've got power to put him under your feet. It doesn't matter whether he comes to you as a roaring lion. You've got the power to put him under your feet. He it doesn't matter if he comes to you as a great dragon. You've got the power to put him under your feet. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. If God be for me, who can, can be against me? Put him under your feet. It doesn't matter how big he is. Put him under your feet. Put him under your feet. Put him under your feet. All of you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. Clap your hands and give God praise. It's in the secret place where victories are won. Musicians come. It's in the secret place where we receive a divine touch of Almighty God. It is in the secret place. It is in the secret place, stand to your feet, where we receive the assurance that God is with us. He uttered it behind. It is in the secret place where we get an understanding and revelation of who he really is and what he can really do. I've got to find a secret place. I've come to tell you today, 
under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Don't you go to the battlefield until you've been in the secret place. You see, so many want to skip the secret place and just go straight to the battlefield. And that's why so many is defeated. That's why so many find themselves in disarray. It's because of the fact of they skipped the secret place and went straight to the battlefield. Because it's in the secret place where you get the power to fight that Goliath in your life. Don't you go to war until you've been in the secret place. Don't you go to face your Goliath until you've been in the secret place. Don't you go to try to obtain victory until you've been in the secret place. Because what you receive while being a shepherd, what you have while being in the secret place, what weapons you have acquired in the secret place. You see, David acquired and worked on his skill with a slingshot in the secret place. What weapons you have learned to master in the secret place will be the very same thing that is used to bring about deliverance on the battlefield. I've come to tell you today that the Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Where you get a true overwhelming power of the Spirit of God it's when you find yourself in the secret place just you and God and it gives you an understanding of who he really is and whether it's a lion or whether it's a bear or whether it's a dragon or whether it's an adder or a serpent you can stand there and declare I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me I encourage you today find yourself in the secret place and God is here now. I don't know what kind of devils some of you are fighting. I don't know what kind of spirits some of you are fighting. I don't know what kind of battles some of you are fighting. They can be as small as a serpent or they can be as a roaring lion. In your mind, they can be as big as a dragon. But the Bible says that God has given us victory over those things in our life. And you do not have to run in fear but exercise your power of the Holy Ghost and God will bring about the victory in your life. Here's what I want us to do all across this building. If you're fighting some things in your life and you need deliverance right now and you need God to do something for you right now, whether it's small or great, I want you to raise your hands all across this building right now. Come on, raise your hands all across this building. Come on, raise your hands all across this building right now. Raise your hands all across this building right now. Here's what I want you to do. If you believe what I'm preaching today, and if you believe that God can give you power and authority as you find yourself in a secret place to overcome those things in your life, I want you to step out of your pew and step right in the aisle. Step out of your pew and step right in the aisle. Step out of the pew and step right in the aisle right now, real quick. Step out of the pew and step right in the aisle right now. Out of the pew and right in the aisle right now. God is about to do something right now. Something's about to rest on you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Now, I want a saint of God to step out of the aisle with them right now. I want a saint of God to step out. Everybody ought to have somebody with them right now. Elders, would you help me? I want a saint of God to step out of the aisle right now. I want a saint of God to step out of the aisle right now and lay your hand on somebody right now. I want you to stand right in front of them and lay your hand on them right now. And those of you that step in the aisle, I want you to shoot your hands in the air. And I want you to declare that God is with me, that God is with me, and everything going to be all right, uh, that I found myself in a secret place, uh, and God is going to provide for me. God is going to work on my behalf. Uh, God is going to do his good work right now. Come on, that's it. Raise your hands uh, and believe right now. Raise your hands and believe right now. You have found yourself in a secret place. Uh, come on, the enemy's tried to lie to you. The enemy's tried to send you a bear and a lion, uh, but God has given you victory, and he's going to give you a victory over in Goliath. Uh, Come on, you're in that secret place. You're in that secret place. Use that which God has given you.